The NFL playoffs are here, so bet with my bookie. Use promo code Gators and get a 50% match with your first deposit. Only at my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Joining me tonight, as he does every Monday night, is Will Miles. You can find him on Twitter at Will Miles SEC and his site, readandreaction.com. And also joining us is Nick Knudsen from American Football Stories. You can also find his work at readandreaction.com as well. Uh, these guys are working on some new stuff there uh, together, just launched today. Uh, we'll put it out there on the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Uh, will, Nick, uh, thanks for uh, hopping on. And Will, let everybody know what uh, you and Nick uh, – have going on uh, that that's new and uh you know it, it was planned for 2020 luckily we got some football and uh you now were able to kind of stretch that content out a bit yeah so we started scrambling there in uh, in july and august when it seemed like there might not be any football trying to figure out what we were going to do and one of the ideas we came up with is we like we both like going back and looking at old football games and sort of re-watching things and it was like you know would it be fun to sort of use a little bit of a mystery science theater type uh type atmosphere, go back, make fun of the announcers, look at some of the fourth down things that people used to do, some of the interesting formations, you know, just sort of remember college football from 10, 15, 20 years ago with, uh, you know, a modern lens and understanding sort of what happens. So with that in mind, we've, we're launching a podcast. It's called 2020 Hindsight. You can find it, like you mentioned, on our Read and Reaction YouTube channel. You can also find it on iTunes. Just search 2020 Hindsight if you want to find that. And that's Nick and I riffing back and forth about old college football games. The first one is the... 2006 South Carolina versus Florida. So the Jarvis Moss cock block, um, you know, getting uh, all the little the little things that you forget. I think some of the things when when we went back and watched it, that you know, Spurrier had called a dagger right before the blocked right before the block field goal that was complete right down the middle of the field would have set up a little chip shot, but his offensive lineman just barely moved right before the play. And so all of a sudden they had to settle for a 48 yard field goal. So those types of things, those hidden plays, the things you, the things you forget, like nobody forgets Jarvis Moss blocking the kick and nobody forgets where they were when Jarvis Moss blocked that kick. But a lot of people forget all the little things that sort of lead up to that point. And uh, that's sort of what we're trying to capture with the, with the podcast. Nick, a lot of people can find your uh, work and they've been reading your work at readreaction.com. And, uh, you know, you and Will had this new venture going. But uh, thanks for hopping on Gators Breakdown for the first time. Hey, this is awesome. Thrilled to be here. Been watching for a while and uh, definitely uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, so, what, like I said, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into uh, that, you know, 2020 hindsight, what that is more about. We'll we'll share our thoughts. I think, Will, you and I have discussed that 2006 Florida-South Carolina game a, a little bit. Uh, but we'll also uh, we'll dive into it a little bit more. But the theme of this episode, of course, we can kind of move away from 2020 uh, right now and look away, look at, look, a, look ahead to 2021 uh, for, for this Gators team. And we're going to do that starting with the offensive side of the ball today. Man, this would be it should be a lot of fun. A lot of change on that side of the ball uh, for the Gators and, and and the Gator offense. Of course, the the big headline there going from Kyle Trask to one Emory Jones. The run game should take more of a focus here uh, for the 2021 Gators. So we'll get into all that. How much this offense will change. And remember, you can find Gators Breakdown. Before we get started, you can find the Gators Breakdown on news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes there, as well as News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators. Please share, rate, and review the show on YouTube. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. really helps us out. Use that new Super Chat feature that we just um, debuted last week. It'll highlight your comment for everyone in the chat to see. If you do so, I'll post it on the stream as well. And uh, look, we get out. You get asked all the time how... You can support Gators Breakdown. That uh, uh, that monetary donation there with the Super Chat helps us out a good bit, too. You can also find Gators Breakdown on any podcast platform out there and follow Gators Breakdown on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. Uh, one quick little news note, I guess, we'll get into before we get the uh, offensive side of the ball here. Uh, of course, uh, Christian Robinson, linebacker coach for the Gators, Came out Friday, about midday Friday, that uh, he was going to be heading off to Michigan. 
uh, put a tweet out there. I had a staff member call and say, hey, 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 no, no, no. This is, is, is it's not happening. It's not anywhere close to that right now. Uh, so, you know, I had to put that out there that he had no deal uh, from Michigan. And, uh, you know, despite all the reports uh, that were out there, uh, as we sit here recording on this Monday night, still looks, still looks like Christian Robinson will be the linebacker coach at Florida. I think we'll get more of a finality to all the rumors that are going around out there on Tuesday uh, as far as Christian Robinson and where he'll go. But, God, that was a whirlwind <laughs> of a Friday and a weekend trying to dispel some of the the, the rumors that were out there. And, look, I, I couldn't say for certainty that he was not going to end up at Michigan, but I could say as of certainty when all the reports were coming out on Friday that he had no – you know, he had no uh, offer from Michigan, and, uh, you know, the, the the plan was to stay at Florida. Well, hey, when you got a staff member calling you to tell you what's going on, <laughs> I think you've got the inside source there, Dave. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you got Todd Grantham himself on the phone with you or something there, right, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell, telling you what's going on. I, You know, I, I think it's uh, it's obvious that, that with all the sort of – um, noise around Grantham. I'm sure that people are sort of sitting there looking and saying, you know, is this a long-term stable job here? And if somebody comes in and offers you more money, um, then it makes sense to make a jump. The problem is, is that I'm not sure it's any more stable at Michigan than it is at Florida. And so you're jumping into that role, getting trolled, getting drilled by Ohio state once, once or twice, and then you're out on the market looking for a job again. So um, besides, if you had to choose to live in Ann Arbor or live in Gainesville, I mean, it's a pretty easy choice. So as long as the money's equal, I'm, uh, I'm sticking with Gainesville. Yeah, the state income tax there too. If the money's equal, hey, that money in Florida goes a little further, a little further. Uh, Nick, I mean, uh, of course, and we'll get into it more next week. We'll talk, uh, you know, defense will be the focus of our 2021 preview. And I know a lot of people have come, you know, out in the last couple of days saying how the linebacker play for Florida in the last couple of years maybe hasn't been the best. And that, that's also kind of split up as well. You know, Christian Robinson is focused on the inside linebackers. Todd Grantham himself coaches the outside linebacker. So that duty is split up. You know, so for all the Mamou Diabate and Mari Bernie playing maybe a little bit outside linebacker and the lack of production there a bit, you know, David Rees, Ventro Miller, the tran you know, transformation to this year at middle linebacker, that's more Robinson's forte uh, there. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do think we'll see him around in Gainesville for at least one more season with, you know, with him paired up with Todd Grantham. Yeah, I, I think it's a good move for him to stay too because it's like uh, it's like Will said, Will nailed it. Uh, when I think stability in college football, I think Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. I, I don't think so. I think <laughs> I think that one's gonna uh, come to a head here in the next year or two. They kind of they gave him an extension. That's pretty much an extension on paper, but it, it's not a whole lot to be excited about if you're a Wolverines fan. But I know they are aggressively pursuing. They fired Don Brown, or and he's out at Arizona now. So I know they're aggressively. Uh, restructuring that defensive side of the ball. But, hey, I, I think if you're uh, Robinson, I think it's a good decision to stay in Gainesville. All right, all right. So now we get to talk this Gator offense and all the changes that are going on there, of course, starts at the quarterback position. No more Kyle Trask. In comes Emory Jones and more the traditional Dan Mullen offense that we saw before Kyle Trask. That's what we're probably going to see here a bit. And look, look, the offense has changed. You know, whether Dan Mullen's been an offensive coordinator or a head coach, you've went from Alex Smith to Utah to Chris Leak at uh, Florida to transform that to Chris Leak to Tim Tebow. And, and then go on to Mississippi State where you basically got a, a glorified running back playing quarterback there early on in this tenure. And then Tyler Russell and then Nick Fitzgerald and Dak Prescott there in between. Uh, I mean, it's it's been different styles of quarterback uh, for Dan Mullen. And now he's going to take another different style all the way from Felipe Franks to the air raid of, of, of Kyle Trask. And now back to more of the run style heavy uh, run approach that we know that uh, probably Emory Jones can bring. And that, look, that's not to say Emory Jones can't sling the ball, can't pass the ball. But look, I, I think if we were to make a prediction here, there's not going to be many games next year where Emory Jones is going to be asked to throw for over 40 times a game. Uh, I think, you know, that, that's going to that's gonna look a little bit different with Emory Jones back there and his ability to run the ball. We'll get into, you know, the, the, the running backs as well. But for Emory Jones, uh, you know, we saw previews in the Cotton Bowl. Take from that what you will. Uh, you, you can, you, you can, if you think that's important, okay. If you if you don't, I'll agree with you there uh, on that point. But guys, I, no question, will I mean this this offense is going to be different next year. 
Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that I think you worry about when you look at the Florida program. I'm not sure the offense or quarterback play is one of them. <laughs> um, I, I mean, and, and you could even look at Mullen's tenure in Gainesville to really think about that, right? So you look at 2018 with Felipe Franks. They ran the ball like 55% of the time. The minute Trask came in, they couldn't run the ball in, in 2019. Trask comes in, shows that he's competent, and now all of a sudden they're throwing the ball 55% of the time, and that continued in the 2020 season as well. You see the same thing when you look at Mississippi State. So in 14 and 15, with Dak Prescott, they were 14th in yards per pass and then 37th in yard per pass in 14 and 15. In 16 and 17 under Nick Fitzgerald, it was 112th and 119th. But when you look at the overall points per game, they were sort of in that 40th range for all four. And so I think that sort of reflects that Mullen is able to sort of maneuver his way around the skills that his quarterback has. The interesting thing for Jones will be under will be is he the guy that we saw when he came in when Trask was injured against Auburn? Or is he sort of the guy that we saw in mop-up duty where the accuracy was not necessarily, at least where it was with Trask, right? I mean, Trask was an incredibly accurate guy. Jones didn't seem to show that. But he did average you know, six yards per rush pretty much his entire career thus far. And so that brings a, a very, very different dimension to what Florida is doing. But if we get the quarterback who went 5 of 7 for 28 yards passing, three rushes for 13 yards in very limited duty when Trask went out against Auburn, led Florida down to a field goal and really sort of helped Florida hold a lead while Trask was getting treated after that knee injury, that, then I think the Gators fans are going to be really happy with what they've got at quarterback. Is he going to be as good as Trask? I mean, that's a hard ask, right? I mean, you know, you're really saying, hey, you're going to be the fourth best player in the country, at least according to the Heisman rankings. And I think we all know that Trevor Lawrence being ranked in front of Trask was sort of a career award, not, uh, not based on on-field performance this year and so you know you're really talking about the third or fourth best guy in the country that's a that's a tough ass to ask Emory Jones to replicate that but I think you can have confidence that Mullen has been able to take different quarterbacks different styles adjust his styles both at Florida and at Mississippi State so I'm not going to be real worried about the quarterback play coming into 2021. Nick I, I think I look at it as and I don't want to make this comparison straight on but the Nick Fitzgerald offense at Mississippi State it's going to be a better version of that. I think Emory Jones had a better arm than Nick Fitzgerald, at least had that reputation coming out of high school. You know, Fitzgerald was playing yep. in a triple option offense there in, in, in high school and then asked to come in and play quarterback for Dan Mullen. And you saw him improve and you saw a, a, a Mullen offense that was successful. But I think you're going to see, see that same style of offense, but a little bit livelier arm from Emory Jones and, you know, being able to make that pass game a bit better than what we saw with Nick Fitzgerald and Dan Mullen at Mississippi State. And that, that's a great point because I think Nick Fitzgerald's a perfect example. I mean, you talk about Nick Fitzgerald to Kyle Trask, and you almost can't get any more different in terms of style of play, right? So Mullen has proved over and over again. I mean, you guys went through and listed most of the quarterbacks he's worked with. He can win with almost any style. He tailors what he does to who he has on the field, right? So I, I think that's something to be – that will relax you as a Gator fan. And also, I mean, just, I mean, the guy's track record with quarterbacks is unbelievable, but Emory Jones has a few years in this system now. So I think he's going to be incredibly comfortable with it. We know he could get it done on the ground. I think the only question you have about his arms is that we just haven't seen it a ton. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't doubt that it's there though. Like the little bits we've seen, he's hit some downfield shots on a couple of occasions. I have, I, I'm not worried about him going forward like I, I have no concerns about him and as a matter of fact I, I, I think I think he's in for a big year coming out we start assuming college football is going to be college football again we start out with FAU and USF and those are two games to really you know put his stamp on this team and, and give some Gator give the Gator fans confidence going into 2021 here's a big thing we're going to see we are going to see Anthony Richardson at some point and I'm not mm -hmm. saying as a starter but he's going to get some playing time. And I do think, you know, the, your, your, your two quarterbacks with the most experience on the roster are going to be guys who are more, more known for their legs than they are their arm. You're not saying they can't throw. You know, Anthony Richardson, these guys are, I think, the true meaning and true definition of dual threat. They, they have arm talent and they have leg talent, you know, that they, they can run uh, along with the best of them. So, you know, very similar style, but – Different sizes when, when you look at these guys compared to each other. Anthony Richardson looks like a prototype of, of what you want a college football player, not just a quarterback, a college football player to look like. That's what you're getting in Anthony Richardson there. And so I do wonder, and I was talking about this with uh, Dave Soderquist and, and Brian on the on, on, you know, on their podcast. Um, and the thing is, with 
Richardson, I think we see him in some third down and short situations just to save the hits from Emory Jones. Emory Jones does not have to take every snap and run on a third and short situation. Like he's been slippery. He's been able to 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 uh, avoid the big hit uh, the last couple of years when he comes in. But I do think you know to 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 save Emory Jones from taking so many hits. If you're going to be asking your quarterback to run a bit, Anthony Richardson's the best bet to go in there and get you one, two, three yards and keep your chains moving. You know, I'm not entirely sure. Mullen does not have a history of, other than the Tebow leak combination at Florida when he was the offensive coordinator, you know, it wasn't like he was necessarily preserving Nick, Nick Fitzgerald by not running the ball. So I think a lot of it has to do with how valuable you think it is to save Emory Jones to have him in the pocket. If taking away that dual threat threat takes away a lot of what he does, then I'm not sure that you're going to put Richardson in there. Um, yeah, I, I look forward to all of the comments that are going to come the minute Emory throws his first interception and everybody <laughs> wants to see Anthony Richards until he throws his first interception and then it'll be time for Jalen Kittner or, or uh, Carlos Del Rio to come in there and play so <laughs> yeah I mean it, the reality is is yeah like you said Dave they, they've got quarterbacks who now fit within the um, really the entire Mullen offense is predicated on running the ball so that the defense has to bring a safety up to stop the run. And what we saw towards the end of the year with Trask is that they weren't able to run the ball. Trask wasn't a threat running the ball, and so the safeties could drop back. And that's sort of what slowed down the offense, especially in the last couple of games. Now, obviously, you couldn't completely contain the offense, but I think we can all say that it struggled far more in the last three or four games than it did against, uh, than it did against Georgia or against Arkansas. And so you're not going to be able to do that, right? It's going to look different because the defense is going to have to do something different. And then you've also got, obviously, a lot of new guys on the offensive line and and some new guys who are pretty skilled at running back, too, that we're going to talk about. So I, I, I think this is one of those things where the entire offense fell on Kyle Trask this year to really have to take the two weapons that he really had in Kyle Pitts and, and Kadarius Toney and sort of, you know, overcome some deficiencies. I think what we're hoping to see in 2021 is that the deficiencies, maybe the highs of each individual player are a little bit lower, but the deficiencies overall over the 11 guys who are out there on the field are going to be a lot less for two reasons. One, because I think you're going to have some younger guys who were recruited to fit these roles. But the other reason is there's actually going to be a spring practice this year. And I think that makes a big difference when it comes to getting guys who were recruited in, in 2019 and 2020 out there on the field, just getting them those extra reps in situations where you can blow a coverage and, and it matters, but nobody cares when you blow a coverage in practice in April. Everybody cares when you blow one in fall camp and then you don't get out on the field. So I suspect that some of the younger guys are going to get out on the field just because they have a spring practice. And then, um, like I said, a little bit more consistency across the board, even if quarterback takes a step back. Which, I mean, let's be honest, if if Emory Jones plays at the same level as Kyle Trask, this team's going to be in, in the conversation for a title again because you get that kind of quarterback play, that's what you, that's where you end up. Yeah, same level, different style. I think we'll, we'll, we'll take that right now. Uh, Nick, I mean, do, do you see AR getting a chance and then to, to maybe submit himself? And I'm not saying a starter and create some kind of some sort of quarterback controversy. I mean, if he does, okay, good. It means he's proven himself and, you know, he's he, he's making that conversation uh, a legit conversation because he went out there and, and proved it. But, you know, do you think do you think he's a, a part of this offense? And uh, I also do wonder, and Will, you might can jump in after this again, too. Since Kyle Trask took over, what what do we see from the last couple of years of offense that we still see coming up, even though the quarterback is changing? I, 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 like, I don't know if, even, if I even have an answer for that, but I do find it interesting. I think when we go and start looking at the offense in 2021, what similarities do we see from the wide open passing attack that we still see, even though the style of quarterback is changing? Well, well, on the Richardson question, I, I think Richardson's absolutely going to get some playing time. Very similar to the way we saw Air, uh, Emory Jones the last few years, where mm -hmm. he might he might even get a series, like you know, maybe randomly in the second quarter he's getting a series. Uh, we didn't always see Jones come in on those short yardage the way we saw like with Tebow and Leak. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a little more sporadic, and I, I think we might see something like that, uh, sim similar with uh, Richardson, but. I the, think random, should, the random second down and eight. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. It, it, but I, I think I think you might just see what, what we've seen so far from Mullen's been interesting because he clearly favors the guy with seniority in the room most of the time. I mean, we've seen Felipe Franks get. I, I mean, think about it. Do we even see Kyle Trask start 
last year in 2019, if Felipe Franks goes down, do we see Kyle Trask at any point? He seems to want to work with what he has in front of him. And he's not looking for to throw the guy out for the next answer right away. So I, I and I think he's stubborn and I think he knows what he wants to do. And I think he feels like he can accomplish it with anyone he puts in front of him. And I think it's it's next man up. I think it's Jones' turn. And I think he's more incapable of filling the role. Uh, even though Richardson, I he he certainly looks dynamic in a little bit that we've seen him. Um, and then regarding the similarities to the offense, I it's just hard to say because I we'll talk about it more. I don't want to get too far ahead of here, but Pitts and, and Tony, mm-hmm. there's no replacement for those guys. Those guys are such unique specimens that uh, there's. it's just going to be different. I think a lot of it's going to be different across the board. So I, I don't see uh, maybe maybe less downfield downfield shots, maybe less downfield shots, uh, uh, more more of the like crossing routes at about 10, 15 yards might be that turn into the 30-yard plays uh, versus like, you know, the 20-yard shots downfield. So that that's really the only – that's the biggest differences I see in terms of uh, 2021. And I, yeah, I, I, I – I yeah. think the I think the stuff you're probably going to see are things like half field reads. So the the strategy for Trask was always to spread the field out, let him read the field, and then decide where to go with the ball. The question is going to be: Is Emory Jones at a point now where he's able to be given that freedom? And if he's not given that freedom, then what you're going to do is you, you don't get a whole lot of value in spreading out the field, diagnosing the defense, and then saying that's where I'm going to go with the ball. If you're not necessarily given the freedom within the offense to do that, it's not a question of is he capable. It's a question of does Mullen give him the freedom because Trash got an awful lot of freedom out there on the field, especially this year. So if you don't if you don't have that freedom, then some of the formations that you would start to think about using would be two tight end sets. If if Gamble's back and then you've got Zipper, um, maybe using guys like Xavier Henderson as the guy on the outside to really mm-hmm. sort of take the top off the defense, and then guys like Copeland. And, and then the running backs, right? A lot of what they did last year were those wheel routes. Well, the question is going to be, Jones has shown he's able to hit the the crossing route over the middle where he, where he, it's a direct throw and you sort of hit it low, you throw it low and you prevent the safety from coming over and breaking it up. The throws I haven't seen him make yet. It doesn't mean he can't. I just haven't seen it are the throws like the wheel routes that absolutely torture Georgia, right? Where it takes some touch to get it over that linebacker who's trailing the running back. And that was a staple of the offense. Having Copeland come in, pick off the, pick off the linebacker who was supposed to be taking the, the running back coming around the edge. And all of a sudden you got Malik Davis or Naquan Wright running around the edge to catch that wheel route. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is going to come down to what do they trust Emory Jones to do within the offense? And if it's a bunch of half field reads, then you're going to see when they're under center. One thing you almost never saw was a play action fake and a bootleg. I think it starts to make sense to start running those bootlegs where you sort of run the tight end across into the flat, mm-hmm. maybe a running back in the flat, a tight end in the flat, and then it's two levels, and that's the read that you give Emory Jones on the bootleg. And if it's not there, he tucks it and runs. And those are the sorts of things that you're going to see. The other thing that I think you'll see is with Nick Fitzgerald, you could see this a lot, where he would spread – Mullen would spread his wide receivers well past the oh, numbers. And so it was clearly a running play from the jump. They were not throwing the ball. But what it did was it pulled all the safeties and all the corners out in that space. And then the only thing he had to do was read the end. And if the end collapsed, he takes it up the outside. If the end doesn't collapse, he hand it off to the running back and you gain five yards and you come back and do it. So I think formation wise, we're going to see some stuff that's much more similar to 2016, 2017 Mississippi State. I think there will probably be some more half field read type things that are just easy reads. And you saw that with Felipe Franks. In fact, if you go back and look at the uh, the Mississippi State game where they were on the road in Starkville, that's the offense I would expect to see next year where Franks was doing a lot of those things where they were giving him half field reads, letting him, letting him sort of roll out and then little bubble screens when the when the defense gave them the opportunity and you just hit that and let your wide receivers run. Yeah, all right, here we go. Next position to help these quarterbacks out. Log jam, log jam, log jam. Damian Pierce, Malik Davis, Daquan Wright, Lorenzo Lingard, all returned from last year's team. In comes five star Demarcus Bowman from Clemson. From Lakeland, you know, looked like he was going to be a Gator at one point just in the recruiting process, but he ends up a Gator anyway. Guys, there are so many options here, and this transformation of an offense is going to help Florida and a big stable of, uh, of running backs here. You know, that spring practice is going to be huge with the, with, with the number that Florida has 
And the five star there to, with the Marcus Bubba, you know, the five star's not coming in here to, to, to sit on the bench. You get another five star on Lorenzo Lingard, you know, who battled some injuries last year as well. Uh, but, you know, you weren't with the structure of the offense. You know, you were going to lay, you were going to rely on Pierce Davis and, and Wright with the way they were showing out last year. Lingard, Lingard didn't get much of an opportunity uh, to show it. But, you know, I brought this up on um, the, the previous podcast I was on this, this past weekend. For me, and then I'm going kind of a, di- a different route here. I want to see Demarcus Bowman on the field. I want to see him early, and I want to see him show out early because we look, we we sit here and we talk about recruiting and, and how much it means. Nothing will speak to recruiting more than a five star, high profile running back going out there and submitting himself as the number one guy and going out there and putting the the spotlight of the offense on his shoulders. If he can go out there with the notoriety of the type of recruit and player uh, he was in high school and to come out here and and show it right away, look, you know, Florida hasn't had the – the big time five star running back come in, in in a recruiting class after recruiting class after recruiting class, and now you got the Marcus Bowman. If he can come in here and show that he's type of that type of high profile recruit, and he's going out there and making plays in a damn ball and offense, to me that only, it, it, it only helps recruiting. And if he's out there doing that, it's only going to help this offense and Embry Jones as well. Yeah, I'm I'm ready to start the Demarcus Bowman hype train. I'm glad you, I'm glad you started because I I was watching some of his highlights earlier today too, and uh, I'll tell you what man, it, it, you have every reason to be excited about this guy. He's coming in uh, out of Lakeland, Florida. Honestly, pretty disappointing that we lost him the first time around in recruiting, but made a quick decision. That's a pretty quick U-turn after about a couple months to come back from Clemson. Uh, but regardless, he ends up in Gainesville. Gators get their shot. Uh, I know that's been a lot of talk is getting those high end guys. We've seen those articles on read and reaction about the importance of that. Um, but I, I really like I really like what I see from him on tape, and I think he can have an immediate impact coming in here. Uh, I was a huge fan last year. I know he didn't get uh, the bulk of the carries, but uh, Naquan Wright really impressed me. I mean, we saw him. You talk about torturing Georgia with those wheel routes. We saw a couple uh, instances of Nick on right getting loose on the backfield in the receiving game too. But it's really – I mean, you could go through Malik Davis, Lingard, Pierce, just an embarrassment of riches in the backfield right now. But we still haven't seen the running game really dominate. And that's – we talked about Emory Jones setting that up. D- you know, do you see – Dave, you see that more opportunity for those guys to really uh, show out, like maybe have multiple, you know, running backs really show out next year. Yeah, I mean, I I live in a fantasy world where Emory Jones and two running backs are back there, <laughs> or yeah. or Anthony Richardson and two running backs are back there. I I thought we might see it a little bit, you know, just just to change it up a bit and, and help the run game with Kyle Trask's quarterback, Emory Jones and a and a Kadarius Tony and and one of those other running backs back there. We didn't get to see uh, much of, you know, I can't really blame the, the the coaching staff too much for that with the the offense and the way it was rolling anyway. Uh, but you know, just to get something in the run game going, I thought we may see something similar to, like that anyway. Now with the bevy of running backs that you have, and Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson, yeah, I, I think you can you, you can see a, a, a vision a, a vision where a quarterback and two running backs are in the backfield. Uh, bring her along that tight end as well, and bring back the old Aaron Hernandez pitch underneath uh, play uh, where, where the, the uh, on the offensive line, uh, the line of scrimmage there. So uh, you know, I think you can get creative with what you have at quarterback and running back with the talent that you have at running back. Will, man, I just say I, I have no idea how they're going to sift through all this in spring practice. This is a good problem to have. But man, I tell you, it's uh Coach staff has got their work cut out for them with, with with all this with all these with all this talent at running back. I mean, and I, and I say talent, and uh, I, I do think they are a pretty talented group. I think they'll and we'll get into it. They'll need some help from the offensive line. But I think starting with Bowman and what we think he can be tied with what we know Pierce or Davis and, and Wright to be, I think that I think the Gators can have a, a, a an improved, formidable rushing attack. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting. You know, Nick mentioned seniority when it comes to Mullen and sort of the way he likes to run his ship. And, you know, last year, I think that made sense where Lingard maybe had trouble getting into the lineup because you had Pierce, Davis, and Wright, and their experience in the system meant that they were going to be better in pass protection and they were going to be better catching the ball because they were going to know where to go and 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 those sorts of things. And Trask needed that, right? You needed someone who was going to be able to pick up the blitz. You needed a guy who's going to be an effective outlet for Trask. I don't know that you necessarily need that quite as much when you have Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson at quarterback 
which means that the guys who excel in pass protection but aren't quite as physically talented aren't as valuable as they might have been last year with a pure pocket passer back there. And so, you know, one of the things you can envision them potentially doing is using Malik Davis a lot more in the slot mm -hmm. and then, and maybe even Naquan Wright in that role as well. I mean, I was very impressed by Wright up until the Georgia game, but when you go look at his actual stats over the course of the year, 54 carries for 213 yards, 3.9 yards per rush. If the Gators offensive line is still allowing penetration, he is not a guy who's going to shake off a tackle and 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 convert it into another three or four yards. That's Damian Pierce. Now, Pierce is not the guy who normally is going to hit the home run when when he's able to get into a hole. So that's really what I think you're looking for from Lingard and Bowman is you're looking for a guy, hey, if you get it to him in space on the edge, is he going to be able to make one guy or two guys miss and take it to the house? If they've got that kind of ability – then obviously they have to get on the field. And again, like I said, if you're going to be doing the half field reads and those sorts of things that I was talking about, then having two running backs in running misdirection type stuff, you know, a lot of the triple option type concepts that Mullen runs from the shotgun become a lot more prevalent when you have a quarterback that you're going to run quite a bit, especially because if you don't want to get the quarterback hit, then, you know, having multiple options from either to pitch up the middle, like you mentioned, or on the outside from an option perspective, you know, you start thinking about, about um, Rainey and Demps, and those are the types of things you start thinking about when you dream about Lingard and and mm -hmm. Bowman being in the backfield. The difference is, is Lingard and Bowman are big dudes. Like they they are not tiny like Rainey and Demps. I mean, those guys were were fast, but they also got taken down pretty easily by a linebacker shooting through the hole. Guys like like Lingard and Bowman are going to take you know you're not going to be able to arm tackle those guys, but they have the kind of speed to take it to the house, and and that's where I start to get excited. But then where do you use the skill sets, right? Because Wright and Davis especially were guys who could catch the ball, and so I do really wonder, especially you know you think about where they use Kadarius Tony a lot. There's not necessarily a guy on the roster that I look at and go, and not that anybody has Tony's ability to change direction the way he does, but somebody who has the ability to go from zero to 60 quickly, a running back's going to have that sort of quick titch, quick, quick twitch ability to do that. You wonder whether Malik Davis in that slot role can start running sort of those crossing routes that Trask was so dependent upon on, you know, the third and four, third and five, third and sixes, where he's able to hit him going across the middle and open things up for the defense deeper later on the later on in the drive. Quick question for this running back group. Mullen's never had a running back like DeMarcus Bowman. And I think we've seen this time at Florida where these, these running back, this running back group, it's running back by committee. You may have a starter, but it's going to get split up. You know, the, the carries are going to get split up, whether it be throughout a game or be throughout a season. With a running back like this, and I'm, I know, I'm asking you to predict and forecast, do you think we may actually see a workhorse running back, or do you still think you know it, it, Mullen reverts back to I'm going to split up the carries just to keep these guys healthy throughout a game and throughout a season? I, I think it could be a game-by-game -game thing, but I absolutely think that overall it's going to be a running back by committee approach. You might see a big game from one guy, one game, next guy, another game. But, you know, maybe when we get into – we're playing Alabama next year. Maybe when Alabama comes into the swamp – Maybe Bowman does get a bell cow type of, of work on that. But uh, I, I don't think that overall through the whole season, we're going to just see that one running back. Yeah, I think it depends on the level of separation. I, I think when you look at Pierce, Davis, and Wright, the level of separation between those three guys was small enough that it probably didn't justify – you know, you, you could bring one guy in for one drive, another guy in for the next drive. You didn't go, wow, I'm missing that guy. As opposed to when you took Kyle Pitts or Kadarius Tony off the field, you went, wow, the offense looks way different without those guys on the field. If DeMarcus Bowman accomplishes that, Right. If he gets on the field, you go, wow, I notice he's not on. Where did he go? Why is he on the sideline? Is he hurt? Like that sort of stuff. Um, if he's if he's that differentiated compared to the other guys, then I think he's going to get a bulk of the carries, as Nick said, in the big games. Right. But there's no reason to run him 25 times against South Florida if you're winning by 30. Uh, at that point, you want to get the other guys in there. But, you know, the reality is, is that when you've got a guy like Bowman, you've probably only got him for two or three years. And so just to sort of bleed him along and, and give him, you know, 50 carries or 75 carries doesn't do you a whole lot of good. You're not maximizing the asset that you've brought into your organization. If you bring in a guy with his level of talent and, and just sort of put him in a running back by committee, eventually he's going to go on to the league and he's talented enough that people in the NFL take a shot at him, even if he's not necessarily, um, you know, 
if he's got good stats and limited reps, the NFL might actually prefer that, right? Because he hasn't gotten beaten up in college. And that's the other aspect of it too, is that one of the things that you do do when you bring in recruits is you say, I'm going to take care of your son to his parents. And one way that you take care of a running back is you don't get him hit against Eastern Washington and you don't get him hit against South Florida. You know, you let him show out against Alabama and Georgia and, and, and teams like that, but you don't give him the rock 30 times because, you know, you do that and it wears him down over time. Now, obviously, Alabama has a little bit different strategy, right? Najee Harris got a lot of the a lot of the carries. I think Derrick Henry had the most carries of anybody in like the history of college football for like the last 20 years. So sometimes you do that, but uh, you know, I, I, I suspect that um, that they will if if he's differentiated significantly, that we'll know it pretty early on. And you know, you could tell the minute Kyle Pitts got on the field in the spring game two years ago, Dave, you and I were there live, we could tell it was different. Right. There was a little swing pass out to him. We went, whoa, like the amount of the amount of space he covered after he caught the ball. You're like, all right, that's different. And you can see the, say the same thing about Kadarius Tony. If Bowman shows like that, I think they'll have a hard time keeping him off the field because the players know. I mean, the yep. players know when a guy comes in, if he's really that much better than everybody else. You know, early in the year, we were like, oh, we haven't really seen Justin Shorter that much. Like, I wonder why is he on the depth chart because of just because of seniority? I mean, Shorter's a really good player. But at no point was I like, why isn't Justin Shorter on the field? Like, you didn't see that type of thing. It was clear that Canarius Tony and, and Kyle Pitts were the guys you wanted on the field. And you weren't going to sacrifice reps for those guys for, for Justin Shorter, at least not last year. So that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking for in the first couple of games, do you see something differentiated? And actually, I would say that in the limited carries that Lorenzo Linger got, you know, he only had five rushes for 32 yards. I think it was against Vanderbilt where he got most of his carries. There was a burst that none of the other running backs have. <laughs> and yeah, well, I, think you, I think you and I even talk behind the scenes. I don't, I don't even think we ever s- discussed on the podcast. It was like, if we do see, maybe not in the traditional running back role, but you're going to throw him in and maybe throw a little swing pass to him and see if you can get him on the edge and see if you can use his speed. We never really got to see that the l- last year all, all that much, but I still think they, that might be his best asset, as, as you were saying, find some way to get him to an edge and just let him outrun everybody. Kick returns, man. Yeah. Put him on kick returns. Put him on punt returns. Use him on special teams. Throw him on the edge. If you're not going to put him in the game for whatever reason, whether it's pass protection or whether it's, uh, you know, or, or whether it's he's not real effective in the passing game, whatever it is, get him the ball in space. And there are ways to do that. I think, again, I <laughs> I started this off by saying I'm not real worried about Mullen from an offensive perspective. I think he's going to find a way to use his best players out there. Um, we may not necessarily agree with all of his choices, but, I, you know, I don't think, you, you know, one of the things for the last three years, I've looked at Canarius Tony and said, why isn't he out on the field more often? But the fact that they kept him off the field likely made him much more disciplined when it came to doing what he was supposed to do and not freelancing out there. And this is what you get this year with 70 catches for 984 yards because he's doing everything the coaches ask of him when he goes out on the field and is able to really perform. All right, these running backs won't do much without the offensive line improvement. And that's where we'll go next. But before we get there, it's that time of year when champions are crowned and legends are born. It's time for the NFL playoffs. And it's your time to win big. You heard the name just about everywhere, and that's my bookie. There's the they're the industry's leading online sports book and casino casino, and it's not hard to understand why. With thousands of lines to bet on all your favorite sports: NFL, NBA, college ball, MMA, soccer. They got all the latest odds. Period. Take advantage of my bookie's prop builder and live in-game betting, where every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Visit MyBookie's mobile-friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to $1,000. Just use promo code GATERS when you make your first deposit. The best part is they make it simple with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make your New Year's resolution a resolution to get paid. Bet, win, and get paid at MyBookie using promo code Gators. So, guys, here we go. Offensive line. We know, we know, we know it has to be better than it was the last couple of years, especially if you're now you're transferring this offense to more of a run heavy style offense. The run game is going to have to take off. And, and I've thought about this before. And, you know, you know John Hefsey, offensive line coach, gets a lot of uh, shade thrown his way just because of the way the offensive line has performed of the last couple of years. And while Dan Mullen, while Brian Johnson, while Billy Gonzalez have been able to 
yeah, you know, go change, change, change the offense and make it work. Maybe John Hevesy needs the more run heavy approach to, to make, you know, make, that's maybe that's what, what he's used to. Maybe that's maybe he's not as easy as adaptable to the change of offense like those other coaches were. And now the shift back to this offense of uh, what they were doing more at Mississippi State. That's more in the wheelhouse of what John Hevesy can develop for and coach for. And I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if there is a bit, a big uptick in, in improvement just because of the style of offense. And look, when Emory Jones was in there, the run blocking, hey, look, it magically looked better. And part of that is when Emory Jones is can can create that. But also I just think you know that suits what John Hevesy wants to bring to the table for an offensive line. So Stuart Gators got some big news this week. Stuart Reese, who was able to to play in that offense under Dan Mullen and John Hevesy at Mississippi State. You know, comes in probably a little bit overweight last year, wasn't able to get hit up by Nick Savage all too much, and now going to get thrust back into an offense that he's more familiar with. Look, he come from Mississippi State, and it was that run-heavy attack when Dan Mullen and John Hevesy left. He comes to Florida, and he's now playing in a – Offense that's passing the ball fifty times a game, so I'm sure that's a big, you know, shock there for 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 Reese. But of course, I think you lose Stone Forsyth, you lose Brett Hagee, your two best offensive linemen. You're going to have to find a way to shift and 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 bring in guys who played sparingly last year, and they're going to have to be counted on. Everybody's a big fan of Ethan White. Everybody's a big fan of Josh Bryan. Maybe Michael Tarquin comes in there at right tackle, and he's the guy to look out for there. But you know, I think Florida has some names and some names we want to see more of. And but get, you know, early on right now, I think there's some confidence that those guys are better than what we saw last year when they're on the field. Now the question is, can they just put it all together as this offense is changing and help the offense grow? Because there's so much. This offense is going to be so much dependent on the growth of this offensive line. Whether it be the quarterback run, whether it be the running back run, it's going to be dependent up front as it as it is all the time. But look, with with the offense with Kyle Trask, you were able to mask some of the deficiencies of this offensive line. You know, Stone Forsyth, Kyle Trask didn't have to worry about his blind side. Oh, he, and he could see what was on his front side. If Gene DeLance was missing a block, he could easily sh- shuffle his feet a couple a, a couple times and get the throw off. You know, this offense now is going to be so predicated on this offensive line opening holes. And, and and getting and getting these running backs lanes, getting these quarterbacks lanes. So I think the transformation back to the run heavy offense is really going to be beneficial for this offensive line and John Hevesy, you know, translating it to these guys as well. Yeah, and, and I I think you make a great point about the adjustment overall. It it it's different at different positions, right? I mean, but I would say when Mullen inherited this program. The offensive line was the position group he had the most work to do on. I mean, you look at the roster, too. It's, I, I can't tell you, look at the 2020 roster. It's just like freshmen, freshmen, sophomores. So, like, these guys are still developing to some extent. And I know uh, patience is not uh, in, in, in inherent in who we are as Gator Nation. But uh, some of these guys, they're coming along. And I have, I have faith and confidence that they're going to get this together, in part because I think the playmakers behind them are, or are going to be uh, a di- completely different style this year. I think I think uh, Emory Jones will open up the running game a lot because I think you're going to have those defensive ends wait a cup that extra split second while they read the quarterback, right? So there's going to be a, a, a lot that we see from this offensive line this year that I think they're going to be able to do different things that they haven't been able to do in the last few years. Yeah, I think there's <laughs> – I'm torn because when I look at the advanced metrics for Florida's offensive line, they really weren't that bad. So power success rate. So football outsiders has a lot of advanced stats for offensive lines in Florida that they've now put together and power success rate, Florida ranked 12th in the country. And I think that sort of meshes with what we saw when it was third and one third and two, especially early in the season, they didn't really have any problem picking up those first downs. They were able to do it. Now, sometimes they had to run trash to do it, but obviously in 2021, they're just going to run Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson and probably be able to pick that out. They were 46th overall in success rate, which is really sort of a measure of did the offensive line do its job. So they weren't great, right? But they weren't horrible either. And so 
um, you know, you sort of combine those things and, and really where they struggled was pass protection, specifically their standard down sack rate was 64th in the country. And it was like 12th about halfway through the season. So the offensive line got markedly worse the second half of the year. We saw a lot of that with communication, especially between Delance and Reese, where where stunts really caused them problems, especially as, as the season wore on. I do wonder whether one or both of them was injured as we got towards the end of the year. And, and Reese um, was for sure. Yeah, so, you know, you, you sit there and you say, okay, you've got some guys who are injured and are, and are pushing through it. You've got guys who maybe don't know the scheme as well as they should because you didn't have spring practice to bring in some of those those younger guys. I think from a running – so I think one of the limitations that you look at for Florida when they were running the ball is just no real home run hitters actually carrying the ball. I mean, because it's – you know, you mentioned when they gave the ball to Emory Jones, they were able to get six, seven, eight yards a pop. But when they gave the ball to Kadarius Tony they were able to get eight, nine, 10 yards a pop. Like when they gave it to somebody who was dynamic back there at running back, they were able to break a couple of those tackles and really sort of move forward. I think, I think that's one of the things you're seeing is that not only was the offensive line somewhat limited, but the running backs were somewhat limited when it came to the rushing game as well. They're solid, but not necessarily spectacular. And so I think the combination of the guys we talked about earlier, particularly Bowman, along with the fact that Reese and DeLance are both going to be back on the right-hand side of the line, you know, I know Delance has his limitations in pass protection, but I'll tell you, if you go look at the film from a running perspective, he's an asset. And I think that's what the advanced stats are kind of telling us is that Florida was, you know, 55, 45 pass to run last year out of necessity. So you were almost taking that right side of the offensive line. You mentioned it with Reese, but I think the same thing's true about Delance. You were taking that right side of the offensive line saying, Hey, do what you do worse because we've got a quarterback who's really, really good and and throws the ball, and that's his strength. And this year what they're going to do is say, okay, now do what you do best because we have a quarterback who meets the strengths that meet your strengths. And so I think we're just going to see a natural progression in the offensive line, not because they've – I mean, one, because they've had another year in the system. Two, because they will have had Savage to keep him in shape and really dominate the fourth quarter. And that was something we actually did see this year is in the fourth quarter, Florida kind of wilted in, in mm -hmm. multiple games as opposed to all season long in, in 18 and 19. They were really, really sort of able to enforce their will on the, on the opposition. And then the third thing I think that we're going to see is that we're going to see some of these young guys who have spring practice, maybe a little bit more athletic and would make mistakes in complex pass protections. And they just won't have to worry about it because they're going to get to fire forward and, and run block and, and do a lot of those sorts of things as well. And the quarterback will be able to bail them out on the back end in terms of being able to spin out of the pocket and those sorts of things. So it's a different offense. I think the offense is probably, you know, to your point, Dave, is more predicated to what the offensive line is, is equipped to do. Um, you know, at the same time, obviously, there you can't just be a turnstile there mm -hmm. when it comes to pass protection because at some point you're going to have to make a block when it's third and eleven. So they're going to have to improve on that too. But but I think overall, when I look at the advanced stats, the thing that I just keep going back to is there's nowhere in there where Florida is terrible on the offensive line. So line yards, which is sort of the overall measure, they're 35th. Standard down line yards, which again takes sort of the passing, they're 26th. Passing down line yards, they're 50 seconds. They didn't run the ball very well when there was a passing. But opportunity rate, just did they do their job? 46th. Power success rate, 12th. Stuff rate, 33rd. So all of these things that sort of indicate that the offensive line is doing its job in the running game, I would have said if I just looked at these stats that Florida had run the ball a little bit better than they did in, in 2020. And part of it is they didn't give their running backs that many opportunities. So on a rate basis, they were pretty good. They just didn't have a lot of opportunities. And the second thing was, I think when they did their jobs, the running backs got seven yards. And what you need for a really elite running game is the running back to get 70 yards when the offensive line does its job, right? Because you hit that one 30-yard run, 170 yard run, and then you hit three or four, five, six-yard runs. You got a running back who's got 17 carries for you know, 126 yards and the safeties have to creep up and then you can start hitting those deep throws. Florida never really threatened the opposing defense with anything long in the running game, which meant the safeties didn't have to creep up. And eventually they just said, you know what, we can't dink and dunk four yards a pop on 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 the running game because we've got a quarterback who can who can pass it 20 yards a pop when he goes downfield. And I think they just made that decision, especially against the better teams. Yeah, I'm trying to come up with it off the top of my head. If I had to name a five right now, left or right, Garage, um, Ethan White, Kingsley Aguaken, Stuart Reese, and then Josh Braun at right tackle or Tarquin at right tackle. And if Tarquin's your right tackle, I think you find a place for Braun at one of the other guard positions maybe. I mean, I think Florida has a good six. 
they can work with there. Um, and I'm because I heard really good things about Iguakin going into the fall camp last year, but Brett Hagee was just playing so well at center, uh, that you didn't take him away from there. But I, I think you know, just going through it in my head right there, and notice I didn't name Gene DeLance, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know, to Will's point, maybe you, in, with this run focused offense, Gene DeLance is more of an asset, and that maybe gives you seven offensive Dave, he, linemen there. He's gonna play, right? <laughs> I know he, he's gonna he's play because play. because if he wasn't gonna play, he would have transferred. He Correct. wouldn't have come back, right? Yeah, so right. he's he's probably got some assurances he's going to play. And again, I think that there's some there's a strength mismatch maybe in 2020 that won't be there in 2021. But he's going to play, and I don't know that he'll be right tackle, but but I think he's going to play, and you got to count him in there as one of the six or seven guys who's going to be out there. Nick, you think so too, man? Yeah, and Will, I was curious with Reese and Delance. Playing together, I mean, how how much of that is the first year they played together with some of those stunts? Do you, that you think they struggle versus they got that extra year under the belt? Maybe a little, little better communication this year. I mean, you would hope so, but I, I think one of the things that's disturbing is it didn't get much better throughout the entire year. I mean, you you look at the. In fact, I was I was about to yeah, write that a in, line got worse as well, the season well, went on. So I was going to write an in defense of Gene Delance article at some point along the year, and I, I didn't that. get it, and I, I, and, I did, and I didn't get it done in the week that I was going to get it done, and then the next week he came out, and I was like, oh, I can't write that article now because uh, <laughs> was it that Tennessee game where he it delayed? Was a, it was the Tennessee game. Yeah, right before that. So, I, look, it's not a defense of yeah. him, but I do think, that, like you mentioned, Reese was already injured, and you start looking at the way some things were going out there, and I think – I'm not sure that DeLance was 100% healthy. The other thing is is that, again, I, I think 12 starts is 12 starts, and at the end of the day, Mullen values that has shown that he values that, and the fact that he didn't transfer this year makes me think that he's got a lot of confidence that he's going to be starting. Now, again, I think there's going to be a lot of shifting going on, right? And and they tried shifting Forzeth over to right right tackle and actually pulled the lance. You do wonder, maybe you move him inside to guard, right? Where you say, okay, inside in the guard, your, your technique is a little bit different and you don't necessarily need the same physical skills that you do at tackle. Let's see how you do. And we see that a lot where guys who struggle at tackle when they're moved inside to guard, all of a sudden become a lot better players. And in fact, I think when you look at the way DeLance run blocks, I actually think moving him inside to guard might make a lot of sense because he did seem to have pretty good strength of the point of attack when he really got on his guy. The issue was more, who am I supposed to block? Not do I block them effectively when they're there. The problem is when you don't know who to block when there's a blitz coming and your quarterback gets drilled, that's an issue. And that was the issue that the Gator fans saw repeatedly was the communication and the stunts, but also just communication on blitzes, right? Not taking the closest guy to the quarterback and allowing the quarterback to sort of read, you know, if the corner is coming, you can't go block the corner and let the defensive end run right by you. And that happened a few times. So, you know, the other thing is, is I would say the offensive line, oftentimes the assignments are unclear. So you see a guy sort of standing out there alone with nobody to block. That's not necessarily his fault. Oftentimes that's part of the design and the defense has done something right to free up a defender to be able to get to the quarterback. And it's someone else's responsibility to get the ball out on a hot route or do something like that. It's not necessarily the offensive lineman who's out there all by himself. It's not his fault. He's got rules and responsibilities he has to follow. You just don't know whether DeLance was following those because there were times where it was obvious where he didn't follow those rules. But you know, again, I think a spring practice, I think those two guys working together, I think potentially moving him inside to guard, um, all of those things are probably on the table, but I'm telling you guys, he's going to play. All right. Opposite from running back, the other skill position, wide receiver, your top ones are gone. You're not bringing back a whole lot like you are at the running back position. No Kadarius Tony, no Trevon Grimes, no Kyle Pitts. We'll throw tight end in here uh, as well as we discuss this position. Jacob Copeland, Justin Shorter, Trent Whittemore, Xavier Henderson. Now that's probably your top four there uh, as we look at this coming from 2020 to 2021. Uh, Jordan Pouncey you know, showed up in the Cotton Bowl as well with a, with a touchdown uh, late in that game. Jamarcus Weston, you know, Jaquavion Frazier's. Uh, Rick Wells, Marcus Burke, Dejon Reynolds, other names that, that that we'll see as far as 2021 goes. Can anybody replicate what Kadarius Tony and Kyle Pitts brought to this offense? No, they cannot. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that one's simple to answer there. With a shift, and then we, we got to keep talking about because you know, the offense is going to change. 
you know, can somebody like Trent Whitmore, Trent, Trent Whitmore do something like Kadarius Tony could do? Can he run the same routes? Can he be counted on on a third and six to, to you know, to, to, to convert? We, we saw it a couple times early on in the season before he got injured. Uh, he could have some big plays. Xavier Henderson could have some big plays. Jacob Copeland could have some big plays. And probably, you know, your number one right now, guys, we'd like to see a little bit more consistency uh, for, from him. Uh, the, the thing with Copeland is he'd make a big catch. And he drop a third and five, or drop a second and six, you know, to to keep to keep it third and six or whatever. So, you know, I, I like Copeland's potential. I, I think he's a, I think he's a big time wide receiver waiting to happen now with his opportunity uh, in, in this offense. But uh, it's going to look different. You know, you don't you don't have the bell out, throw it up to Kyle Pitts. You don't have the 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 Kadarius Tony dig your foot in the ground route when you know, twirl and backflip and handstand all your way off to, to the, to the middle of the field and, and then make a catch and then make 15 people miss on the way for a touchdown. And that that's going to be missing uh, for, uh, from this offense. But with the shift in offense, Florida's got some big bodied receivers here. And that, that's kind of been the history of a, of a Dan Mullen and Billy Gonzalez recruiting big style of offensive uh, or big style of you know offensive weapons here with this wide receiver group. So I think there's a, a lot of potential here, but a lot of figuring out just how much these guys can I don't next probably, you know, stay status quo and, you know, and status quo as far as being a dependable group, you know, 2000, 18, Dan Mullen's first year comes in and you have Freddie Swain and Josh Hammond and those were four-star recruits, Tyree Cleveland. And, you know, we didn't – we weren't getting what we wanted to out of those guys basically because, you know, Jim McElwain and Doug Nussmeyer's offense was inhumane uh, to us Gator fans. But we were waiting for those guys to turn it on. And the, the, we you, you could tell right away in a different offense and, and a different wide receiver coach speaking to those guys, you saw the potential. They took off in 2019 – Think you, you know, I think you got to have a lot of confidence in Billy Gonzalez and what he's been able to produce the last couple of years that, hey, these guys, these guys that we're looking to take over for Kyle Pitts and Kadarius Tony, they can go out there and do some good things as well. Well, it's not a Gators breakdown episode until Doug, Doug Nesmeyer comes up. So <laughs> congratulations on that, Dave. Uh, I know that no, it's a favorite target uh, on this podcast. It, it, it well deserved to. We we suffered. We suffered through that. But I liked what I saw from Xavier Henderson early on. We don't see a ton of uh, freshman receivers get on the field. But, I mean, we saw Trent Whittemore, too. I feel like Tr- Whittemore was, was real interesting to me. I think he could become a – a nice uh, uh, slot type guy in this offense, and, and really could be a productive receiver. Uh, Copeland, Copeland, I'm, I'm I'm a huge fan, but I I put him almost in the same category as Shorter, where like all the tools are there. You you just want to see a little more in terms of the game to game, like showing up game to game uh, on that. But I, I like what I see from Copeland overall. Um, Frazier's I'm very interested in. He's got great tape from high school, and the kid out of Jacksonville, uh, uh, um, Burke. Burke out of, uh, I believe he went to Trinity uh, Christian, Marcus Burke. Uh, hey, I mean, if you watch his tape, speed to burn, great hands. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward. I hope he gets some run uh, next year too. But you saw Pouncey pop up in uh, the bowl game. I know it was a pretty meaningless drive. But I just, again, similar to the running back room, you do have a lot of weapons, even though we're losing our, our, our big guns. We're, lo- we're losing Grimes. We're losing Tony. But – Grimes had a great finish with that Alabama game. I mean, I was, was, I felt great that he had an awesome finish that game, but I mean, statistically he wasn't, it's not like he was catching like eight passes a game. Like I think we could replace him in in the offense. Uh, uh, Tony is just a special talent. Uh, There's no one. I mean, I would almost put him as all purpose. So you're not going to replace him in just one room anyway with their running back or receiver. It almost had to be what Will was talking about, where some one of those running backs turns into maybe a slot receiver or something like that at some point. But I, I, I think this group can steadily improve as the year goes. Again, you got some young guys that can step in there with a chance to make a play. But I would say if you had to pick one guy to really circle that if this guy makes big improvement this offense is going to do some real special things is Xavier Henderson I mean he's he's got he he got on the field plenty of times but what wasn't exactly showing up on the stat sheet all the time but you could tell that guy's I mean he's just built for this position so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to see if he can make some progress in 21. Will yeah this how is do, how do how do the Gators replace Kyle Pitts they don't yeah. This this is the this is the position grouping that I am most worried about. 
So when you when you really look at the offense and you look at whether you will know early on whether Florida has been able to – whether Florida is going to be able to have an offense similar to last year's or whether it's really going to take a step back, I think this is where I get worried. And the reason I get worried is when Kyle Pitts was out against LSU and LSU was able to slow down Kadarius Tony at times. Now, Tony still torched him pretty good in that game. But when Trask went away from Kadarius Tony in that game, there wasn't a whole lot of separation for the rest of the wide receivers. There was one throw to Copeland where he got tripped up, where he almost took to the house. And then beyond that, who was open? And, and that's the thing that worries me is that you look at it and say, okay, the guys who were in there, Trevon Grimes, Kamori Gamble, um, Henderson in some respects, you know, those guys weren't necessarily getting open against walk-ons for LSU, to be honest with you. And so, granted, the entire team kind of came and slept walk through that, that LSU game, but – I think that's indicative of the concern that I have is that you got these guys who are all really, really big, but the reality was is that Pitts and Tony, through their own unique skill sets, were able to create separation on third down. And when you had both of those guys on the field, you couldn't double team them both. So there was either a zone for somebody to sit in or you had a one-on-one coverage, usually with a linebacker or a safety and that was just a mismatch for either one of those guys. And so they don't have those physical mismatches, which means you're going to have to scheme your guys open. Now, some of that is going to be the run, tied to the running game, right? That you're going to get a lot of man-on-man coverage. There you go. You, say, you, it won't be dependent on the wide receivers like it was this past year. Yeah, absolutely. And so, But there's going to be a time where it's 3rd mm-hmm. and 12, and no one thinks you're running the ball, and you're not going to run the ball. And you're not going to be able to run a play action like Nussmeyer would third and 12 and open things up, right? I mean, you're going to have to throw the ball into a tight window. And the question that I have, it's either a tight window against the zone or if it's man-to-man, you're going to have to get some separation. And thus far, guys like Shorter, guys like Henderson, um, guys like Gamble, guys like Zipper have not necessarily shown the ability to do that. Now, that doesn't mean they can't but they haven't shown that ability. Like when I think about the offensive line, I say, all right, I see some stats that say these guys have been effective and we've got enough guys back that I think maybe we'll be all right. All right. Worst case scenario at the running back position, Pierce Davis and Wright put up the exact same season they had last year with Emory Jones running a little bit. The running game's a whole lot more effective. Okay. Emory Jones has two years in the system. He's, he's sort of gotten his feet wet. He's going to be able to step in this year, same way Tebow did in 2006 or 2007. Um, you know, but when I look at the wide receivers, uh, there's just not a lot of, you know, the fact that Rick Wells was getting was getting quite a bit of run there towards the end of the year worries me because you would hope that those sorts of throws would be going to guys like Henderson, Pouncey, Weston, and Frazier's, and they just didn't. Now, again, it might be COVID. You know, guys didn't have spring practice. That impacts things. But I think a lot of it is, is that it takes a lot to get into sort of the circle of trust for Billy Gonzalez and Dan Mullen. And uh, and so we'll see, right? I mean, but th- this is the area where if in that first couple of games you see separation. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that one receiver has to have a huge game. I'm saying that when you get out there against the USFs of the world, you better be beating their corners when you've got one-on-one coverage. And if you see them beating them and getting separation – then that means they've got their technique down, and that means they've got the skill to do that at least somewhat consistently in the SEC. If they're having trouble separating early in the year, I'd start to get concerned, or at least I would start to really start hoping that the offensive line has developed because you're going to be a run-heavy offense at that point. Yeah, they're going to get their chance. With this style of offense, they're going to get their chance down the field. They're going to get their chance play action one-on-one uh, where they're going to be asked uh, to, to, to beat that coverage and go downfield because you know, you know, the, 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 the rocker step play action – that's going to be coming back. <laughs> that that play is going to be coming back, and you know, your your receivers are going to be asked to beat. Uh, and and that's when you're only sending three receivers at the most, two time two receivers at, at some point in, in those type of plays. So you know you know you're going to be asked to for those uh, receivers to go out there and make plays. You know, tied in before we wrap up here. Yeah, you're not replacing Kyle Pitts. We did see Gamble and Zipper in them in that mid midpoint of the season when when Pitts was out. They showed some nice things. Then we get to the bowl game and drops galore, and I know that's the last thought a lot of people have in their minds. But don't forget what Gamble and Zip did toward the you know the middle point of the season. I think they can give you some confidence there. Uh, but you know for those guys, it's going to be a different style of offense as well. You know you're not going to be asked to do what Kyle Pitts did. Nobody's going to be asked to do what Kyle Pitts did. So I think for 
the 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 small window we saw in the middle of the season when Kyle Pitts was out and we saw Zipperer and and and, and Gamble do some things against Georgia and Arkansas there in the middle of the season. I think you can look at that for you know the potential that those guys can bring to the table. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think both of those two, especially that Arkansas game, you saw a little bit of that. Uh, and, and they got a couple guys coming in too with uh, Gage Wilcox yeah. and uh, Nick Nick Elks, and they started Jacksonville, another Jacksonville guy, Episcopal High School. Uh, but I, I think I think this is absolutely a situation where you're not gonna you're not gonna replace the guy. He, he just he was special. That's who he was. But are they going to be guys that can get open and maybe like every I don't know, two to three games here, they're making a big play type of thing. Yeah, I think they could bring that element to the offense. And uh, and other than that, they could be maybe just uh, steady receivers in the middle of the field for a uh, first-year starting quarterback. Well, and I think, I think from the standpoint of – Will, bringing up your favorite thing too, blocking. <laughs> there you go. That's right where I was going. There you is, go. Is that these guys don't? These guys need to be an extension of the offensive line for the way Floor is going to have to run their offense next year. They don't know. They aren't going to be able to be Kyle Pitts, and I don't think you should ask them to be Kyle Pitts. What you're going to do, I think, what you're going to see is that they're going to be really extensively used in the red zone. Because those plays where the tight end fakes blocking and then sort of leaks out. Are plays that are now back in back in play. You couldn't do that with Kyle Pitts because they were already double teaming him, and they were like, "No, nah, he's not blocking." I mean, he he actually turned into a pretty decent blocker this past year, but nobody was sitting there going, "Yeah, you're going to run behind Pitts." Gamble is much more of a is much more of a blocker, and Wilcox pretty big pretty big dude. So you know, you start talking about if you can use these guys as an extension of your offensive line, then you can start using some misdirection to get them open. So it's just a different type of player, and and it's not good nor bad. It's just different, right? I mean, you get transcendent guys like Kyle Pitts coming through your program. Tight ends do not end up 10th in the Heisman voting very often, especially when they miss two or three games. <laughs> and and that's what we saw this year from Kyle Pitts. And so to say, it's the same thing I said about Kyle Trask when we started. Like To expect Emory Jones to be the fourth best player in the country is an expectation that I think is going to be really difficult to meet. To expect Florida's tight ends to be as good as the 10th best player in the country is something that our expectations are probably not going to be fulfilled if that's what the expectations are coming into the year. But can you get, say, the 30th best player in the country, the 40th best player in the country, and get that at four or five different spots where everybody sort of has to share responsibilities? That's what you're looking for, right? And so the key, I think, for the tight ends is can they do enough in the passing game that when they're in the game, you're not like, oh, this is a running play. And that was one of the things that especially early on in the year when Gamble was in the game, the defense was keying on the run because they kind of figured, all right, Pitts isn't in here. They're going to try to establish the run. Once Gamble showed he could catch the ball a little bit out of the backfield, well, then that changed things a little bit. And so that's, I think, what you're looking for is somebody who's an adequate catcher out of the backfield can keep the defense honest and then has the ability to, to run block. It's just different, right? I mean, one of the real advantages Florida had was you bring in you you bring in Pitts, you put him on you know in line, and you you know maybe you end up with him on a linebacker. You split him out, and all of a sudden you end him out in space on a linebacker, or maybe a linebacker and a safety. Or they have to rotate a safety over to double team him, which opens up something else on the other side. These guys aren't going to demand that kind of attention, at least not yet. But again, I don't know that they necessarily need to, based on the way Florida is going to be running their offense. And here we go. Just because it's the hot name in the transfer portal, we'll probably get the word in May. Eric Gilbert from LSU. We'll have to keep our eye on that one. If there, if Florida is going to replace Kyle Pitts, it's going to be that guy. It's going to be that player. Uh, so we'll see uh, where that comes. We'll have to keep our eye out. Uh, looks like he probably won't enroll anywhere until May. He may make his decision before then, but we may have to wait until May before we hear from one Eric Gilbert and where he'll end up the transfer from LS. You guys, before we wrap up 2020 hindsight, let's get back into that. You said 06 Florida, South Carolina well, was a game episode that you put out uh, today. What other games you got on the docket? And uh, I guess, uh, Nick, we'll, we'll start with you. And we'll kind of, I had already mentioned what he kind of learned from the 06 uh, Florida, South Carolina game. What did you go back and looking at that game? What did you take away from it? Well, I was a sophomore in college at Florida when it happened, so I was I was in the stands for that one. I ended up uh, in the row in front of me uh, after Moss made that block. But uh, man, that was a stressful game all the way through, and, and you just uh, I, I went back and I, I really 
forgot. I remember it being more of a sloppy game on Florida's part, but you really go back and South, South Carolina played very well. Yeah, that day to keep it in and uh, really give them a little more credit uh, than I than I remembered. But it's like Will said, it's just it's fun going back and looking at some of these old games. I mean, even two thousand six. Was some time ago now, but you feel like, yeah, I can tell you most of it, especially national championship season. But I mean, you see how many instances in that game could have cost the Gators a national title, right? One little moment, one little moment can cost you. And uh, we learned that we learned that this year too about that, that one moment every now and then. But uh, it, it just everything kept going Florida's that way in that game, and uh, it just it worked out great. But that was that was a great finish to, to the 06. Uh, Will has a good format, how he, how we go through the games too. I mean, it's very much similar to those rewatchables episode on the Ringer. That's the inspiration, and uh, I, I think I think it's a fun podcast, especially if you're you really it's for college football nerds too. I mean, if you really you really got to appreciate some of the history and everything with it, and I think we have a good time with it. So, looking forward to breaking down more episodes, and uh, I know we got one coming up with uh, the Miami Ohio State national championship game and the Fiesta Bowl, and you just get to hear uh, Will talk about two of his favorite programs of all time. <laughs> well. <laughs> Fortunately, Nick grew up a Buckeyes fan, so I had to give him a little bit of uh, a little bit of crap for that. I'll tell you, for that 2006 game, Florida, Florida, South Carolina, the thing I'd forgotten was that Chris Leak made two critical runs on the last touchdown drive for Florida. And you don't think of you think of that team as well. They bring in Tebow when they need the run, and Leak was the guy who dropped back and made the throws. In fact, when you look at that game, some of the throws Leak made weren't all that great. Dallas Baker really bailed him out in the first half on a ball that he threw that was really really short, and Baker came back and snatched it away from the corner to tie the game up at seven. And then when Florida was down sixteen to ten after Mar Moss blocked the extra point. Florida drives down the field and not only did so Leak had like a seven yard run to set up a fourth and one that then Tebow came in and converted. He also had like a 20 yard run on a read option. And then he had like a nine or 10 yard run on just a quarterback draw that really sort of set up that entire drive. And when you think of that 06 team, you do not think of Chris Leak as the guy who's the running quarterback. It, but really, it was the epitome of the Dan Mullen willing runner type of language that we hear these days with, with all that sort of stuff. So Nick sort of mentioned what we do on the podcast. We do So we've got some categories we run down, obviously looking at things through the big picture. We've got the Urban Meyer indigestion moment of the game where we're uh, talking about how the coaches were, uh, you know, when, when was the coach the uh, – um, you know, when, when was the coach the most anxious during the game? Sometimes it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not exactly what you think, right? Like if I was the coach, when would I have been the one who was the most anxious? We've got the, uh, non-political just, but it, it, it sort of made sense at the time. We call it the Donald Trump lies. We tell ourselves, which is what the losing team tells themselves to make themselves feel better after the game. Um, and, and then we look at, uh, the Alan covert, who's one of the guys who's in all of the, uh, all the Adam Sandler movies or one of the six guys who's in all Adam Sandler movies. As <laughs> <laughs> but sort of who's the guy we forgot about, right? Like who's the guy that you're just like, oh yeah, that guy, you know, Makovica on Texas was, or, or was one or on Nebraska was one of the guys that I had completely forgotten the, the fullback in those, uh, in those John or in those Tom Osborne years. So, you know, you mentioned uh, Miami, Ohio state's coming up. We've also done the 06 Rose bowl for USC and Texas. That's going to be coming out pretty soon. Alabama versus Clemson, the Deshaun Watson game where they had the pick play to score the touchdown at the end, Nebraska versus Missouri in 1997, where the uh, Nebraska player kicked the ball to one of his teammates at the end. UCLA versus Miami in 98, which is Edger and James um, going off and, and winning the game. And again, one of those things you forget is that was key and instrumental in, in Florida season that year. You got Texas Tech versus Texas 2008, the Michael Crabtree catch. LSU versus Kentucky, the, uh, the, the, bluegrass, the bluegrass miracle, which I'll tell you, the funniest thing on rewatch for that one was Saban walking off the field like ashamed at having won the game. <laughs> like, like they're interviewing him afterwards. He just didn't want to be interviewed because he was so ashamed of how his team had played. So unique, though. Nick Saban just having a joyless experience winning. That's just such a different thing from Nick Saban. <laughs> So then I think the one I had the most fun with was we did recently, we did one Northwestern versus Notre Dame back in 1995 and Northwestern was a 28 point underdog. And it was the Ron Paulus experiment when everybody still thought he was great. And Bino cook was saying, Paulus is going to win three Heisman trophies. And you're just looking at the Notre Dame offense going, wow, college football has come a long, long way in 25 years. Like you would not recognize, you put that Notre Dame offense with Paulus, who was supposedly this wonderkind who could just, you know, chuck the ball all over the place. You take that Notre Dame offense and compare it to what Florida did this year, 
And it's just like, wow, like night and day, how different is this? So it's fun to go back and look at it. Um, fun to talk about what happened and really sort of fun to see the evolution of college football as you see coaches who never go for it on fourth down back in 95 and 96. And then the evolution of that, you see sort of the evolution of the tight ends. Um, <laughs> the the Nebraska-Missouri game, you had guys who it was still back in the back in the day where right before the snap, the offensive linemen shift into their three-point stance. Like, I haven't seen that in years. I look back and just go, whew, like, I forgot about that completely. So uh, so it's a fun time. Hopefully people check it out. Good stuff. Good stuff. So every week for now or every month or? No, nah, we're going to be releasing them every week. So okay. you, can, you can head over to the Read and Reaction YouTube site. Please subscribe there. That helps us out. Or you can find it on, on iTunes at 2020 Hindsight. No slash in the 2020. But we named it that because we want to leave 2020 in, in, in the rear viewers. We're looking at some of these old college football games. So, uh, so, so anyway, check it out on iTunes. Check it out on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, you should expect it to be once a week um, during the off season. So when you, when you got a football, Jones, you sort of want to relive something, see, uh, see if how you remembered it is actually – how it how it happened that's one of the things i think has been most surprising to us is just that it is uh how we remembered it is nothing like how the game actually went bad when, when we've looked at these things <laughs> uh nick quickly before we wrap up here uh american football stories what's that what's that about for our listeners out there yeah, so I have a podcast called the American Football Stories Podcast uh, up on iTunes, up on YouTube. And again, like just like Will said, uh, please subscribe there on YouTube. Definitely could use it. But uh, put it out. We've been putting out three a week on those. We do picks. We've been doing – in the fall, we did college and pro football. And uh, I'm cutting it down to just college. I love college football. We just want to do – uh, we want to go deep. We want to go very deep on, on the material, but we want to cover, we cover things nationally. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about the games in season, but the off season, it's going to be a 365 day a year uh, type thing. And uh, we're going to get into some uh, deep dive stories and, get, and give you the background on something. You know, maybe there's something going on at Texas. You don't know a lot about or or LSU or Tennessee. So something like that. So something a little outside of the sec uh, footprint, if you're interested in learn more, but American football stories. Check it out. Well, I would say that at one point he interviewed Kevin Kelly, who's the guy in, in I think it's Texas, but the high school coach who always kicks onside kicks and always goes oh, yeah. for it on fourth downs and that sort of stuff. So if, if you're interested in analytics, if you're interested in sort of one of the brighter minds who's really sort of changed the way people look at football, that'd be a good one to check out over, over there at his podcast. Will's doing a better job of plugging my own podcast than I am. Thank you, Will. <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> we also are going to get into uh, – we're going to be hev heavily into the draft too. So we actually had a, a guy, Matt Waldman, on where we actually did a whole episode on the Florida before it was the week before the Florida Bama SEC title game where we broke down a lot of the prospects for both teams on the offensive side of the ball so a lot of pits a lot of Tony talk Trask projecting to the next level what what he thinks he does a great job at the rookie scouting portfolio uh so ch check him out there but he he gave us his full thoughts on Florida's playmakers um and then uh, uh gonna have uh Dan Shanka from our lads on in the next couple of weeks uh he helps uh with the senior bowl uh shrine bowl not senior bowl shrine bowl east west shrine bowl selections uh from our lads so get some good scouting talk on there if you're interested in the nfl draft too all right that's nick newton american football stories you can read the stuff at readreaction.com that's will's site you can find him there too one more time read and reaction.com you can find will on twitter at will miles sec guys anything else before we wrap this one up thanks for having me on Appreciate yeah, it. Man. Absolutely. We'll do it again. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Just uh, appreciate everybody's interaction as always. And, you know, hey, we got through 2020. That's been, uh, you know, both the year and the season. So it's. I'm excited to see what Florida can do in 2021, especially with uh, Mullins' handpicked quarterback. There we go. There we go. Offense this week, defense next week as we preview the 2021 Gators. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.